where Mikola Vilaskov has joined us. Mikola is a senior research fellow at uh, the Europe at, at uh, Ukrainian National uh, National Strategic Study Institute, if I uh, pronounce it correctly, under the president of uh, under the leadership of the president of Ukraine. And he's also an analyst at uh, the Comeback and Alive Charity Foundation, one of the uh, most prominent Ukrainian uh, charity foundations, which helps uh, Ukraine to win this war. Welcome, Mikola. Welcome to this to this uh, live broadcasting. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, my first question is, and that is uh, what is uh, interesting for all of us: what is going on currently? on the battlefield. Uh, you have posted recently, a few hours ago, a very interesting thread on your Twitter uh, on the different views from the US side on uh, did Ukraine do it right, not having a concentrated punch through the Russian defensive lines, like jeopardizing more uh, losses, but uh, maybe winning more success. Uh, or was it the right strategy to uh, do smaller steps and having like tactical gates? Uh, what is the overall assessment? Well, uh, you referred to the ongoing debate about pros and cons of Ukrainian military strategy, and uh, that's the development that is anticipated, I would say, and people are going to debate uh, lively and extensively the decisions adopted, how this was that kind of decision uh, prior to the Ukrainian offensive, affected ongoing Ukrainian offensive. If we are talking specifically about uh, ongoing Ukrainian offensive, so we managed to uh, pass through so-called security zone in the area of Robotina, and we created so-called bulge salient, and we try to enlarge the so-called uh, bulge. If you take, uh, for instance, situation in uh, this Robotina Verbova bulge, so we are trying to enlarge it to make it as wide as possible. And in process, of course, we are treating Russian forces. We are striking priority targets, so-called like Cuban rocket artillery, electronic warfare, air defense system, and uh, we try to treat Russians uh, as much as possible, preserving our own forces and. Uh, finally to create an opening to move forward, to move towards Stockmark. Well, but if we like summarize the events of the last uh, week, like not even weeks, the last week uh, on the battlefield, we met with you like early June and uh, you have shared your insights with what is possible, what is not possible, where it could be like the bottlenecks of this offensive. But what we have seen within the last week, we see that uh, the Ukrainian army has achieved uh, incredible success on hitting Russian high-value targets in Sevastopol, in Yevpatoria, in other regions where Russian, uh, Russian naval uh, ships have been hit, Russian uh, naval docks have been hit, Russian high-value uh, air defense uh, units have been hit. And we have also seen since like the last like two weeks uh, that the losses of Russian artillery uh, have like skyrocketed with over 40 or even 50 pieces a day. We also see today the report of Ukrainian military intelligence that uh, Russians, Russian soldiers, uh, about like 170 soldiers a day capitulate to uh, the Ukrainian army. Are we witnessing now some sort of uh, like of a changing moment in this war when Ukraine is gaining like more uh, chances to hate the Russian army and achieve like some significant success? Uh, well, there is a lot of developments. You mentioned them, but uh, let us separate a little bit because as for me, what's going on uh, in temporary occupied Crimea at sea and what's going on on the front line? These are more parallel stories. Uh, definitely with uh, like striking the Russian air defense system and opening ways to strike Russian military infrastructure in temporary occupied Crimea, it might positive effect uh, and might create conditions for Ukrainians move, moving forward in uh, southern mainland. But right here, right now, these stories are more like a parallel stories. And if we are talking again about the front line, 
most analysts uh, agree that uh, well uh, the two most important factors is the balance of munitions and reserves no one knows precisely this balance of munitions and reserves uh, but all agree that these two would be most important factors and uh, what is striking in this uh, uh, operation Ukraine conduct and the way uh, Russian conduct in defense in the Zaporizhia region, what is most striking is that they've thrown everything in the first line of defense, in a so-called uh, security zone. Because uh, if they follow textbook, uh, they needed to slowly withdraw with fighting, slowly exhausting Ukrainian forces, preserving as much as possible of their own forces and equipment, and then laying conditions for counterattack. But what we've seen, they've thrown everything in the first line. That's why very little movement, very little change of uh, territories. That is uh, one of the reasons why, uh, until recently, especially in the area of Robotina, there was very little movement. That's uh, this, the situation going on on the front line. If we are talking about development specifically in temporary occupied Crimea, at Black Sea, uh, it's also very important developments, uh, but they are more related to the freedom of navigation. They are more related in general to decreasing the capabilities of Russian Black Sea fleet. And uh, as I said, uh, the only possible connection is that if we open more ways to strike military sites in temporary occupied Crimea, uh, on which Russian grouping of forces in the Zaporizhian Helstone region de uh, depends, then of course we would create more favorable conditions to move on. But right here, right now, these are kind of feral stories. More. But if we uh, like stay a bit with this spectacular attack on the Russian naval facilities uh, in the occupied Crimea, how was it possible to do it? Like the Russians um, finally, like they acknowledged that uh, several. Uh, Ukrainian cruise missiles have hit their uh, naval vessels. Uh, was it like somehow connected with this spectacular operation of the Ukrainian special forces when they took control over the um, over the gas and oil rigs in the offshore platforms, which were probably the places where the Russians had their uh, their air defense radars or some sensors? Uh, like, how was this operation possible? It, well, first of all, this kind of things, they require weeks of planning, very detailed planning. It's not the kind of things that could be uh, done like in a couple of days. So it's uh, synchronization with a lot of elements. And yes, since uh, uh, this kind of uh, missiles, they have very uh, lower uh, flight paths, very lower one. It means that they might be detected uh, Lately, I mean, very little time for reaction response. And if we decrease this Russian situation of awareness, uh, depriving them of the situation of awareness, it first allow us to do this uh, launching, uh, I suppose, somewhere near uh, the coast of the Black Sea, not like striking from the depths of Mykolaiv region, but maybe from uh, the very coast, either in Mykolaiv or in Odessa regions, given the uh, range of this um, uh, storm shadow, uh, Skalp uh, uh, cruise missiles of 250 kilometers. So, yeah, I suppose there is this kind of connection that deprived Russian of early warning, so-called, and uh, left them with very little time to respond. That's why... Uh, there was this, according to the Russians, quite a big salvo, because 10, 10 missiles is quite a big salvo, and some of them managed to pass through it. But of course, it's a Russian statement. There might be a situation when there was uh, the salvo of lesser degree of lesser scale, and the Russians didn't manage to intercept anything, given, uh, again, this sea skimming uh, capabilities of these cruise missiles, given stealth characteristics of these cruise missiles. That's why... It's a very sophisticated operation. Yes, there is the direct connect with previous actions with depriving the Russians of situation awareness. And uh, who knows how much of these missiles were used and uh, how much Russians really intercepted. Well, thank you. Thank you for this insight. This is Mikola Beleskov. We are talking live on the YouTube uh, from Lviv to Kiev, where Mikola is currently uh, located. Mikola is a senior research fellow at National Institute for Strategic Studies in Ukraine under the leadership of uh, the president of Ukraine, Zelensky. And uh, we're talking about the Ukrainian counteroffensive and the out, uh, outlook for this war.
Uh, we have currently in Germany this discussion on Taurus missiles. So should they be delivered to Ukraine or not? They are pretty similar on their characteristics to uh, Storm Shadow and Scalp missiles, a bit more like uh, a bit more uh, better design for hitting uh, bunker targets and like uh, Russian targets uh, was designed like for the Baltic Sea uh, for the Baltic Sea region against the Russian Baltic fleet. Uh, um, how does it look like this discussion from the Ukrainian point of view? Uh, are Taurus missiles so much needed for Ukraine? What kind of, uh, what kind of um, positive effect could this delivery have for Ukraine? Well, uh, first of all, we appreciate uh, different kind of assistance provided by Germany, especially we value German contribution in the air defense segment. It's incredible. Is disproportionate, I would say, uh, securing Ukrainian skies and guaranteeing uh, this segment of security. But the problem is that no war is won by sticking to defense. And that's precisely the scene. And since we've seen quite successful employment uh, of uh, Storm Shadow Sky, uh, also air launch cruise missiles, that's why there is plenty of targets uh, that might be destroyed by this kind of. Uh, Missiles, the only problem, of course, is that maybe people are having in mind situation in uh, Kherson last year in the right bank of Dnipro, where for Ukraine it was uh, possible to do a full isolation of the uh, theater of military action, given Russian high vulnerability, high dependence, quite few uh, connections across Dnipro. The situation, ongoing situation, I mean, in a disoffensive operation, given geography is quite different one. So we... We'd like to destroy fully like these links connecting uh, Changar uh, and uh, temporary occupied Crimea, which is the shortest road for a supply. Uh, uh, but we can do full isolation. That's why we are all for to receive this kind of uh, this kind of uh, missiles. There is a lot of targets for them. I subscribe for for the idea that since we have a deficit of high explosive projectiles of the cluster munition projectiles or other projectiles, it can be compensated with uh, short-range ballistic and cruise missiles. There is a lot of target, but of course, uh, compared with Kherson offensive, we can do fully this so-called isolation, given the unique features of geography, but no matter, it's better to have a couple of dozens of air launch cruise missiles with the proper range, with the proper payloads, than not to have them. What are the uh, most crucial goals which the Ukrainian army need to achieve now? Like when we look at the map, we have seen that what you have already uh, perfectly described that the Ukrainian army is going step by step, pretty pretty slow, like digging through the uh, Russian uh, defense lines where the Russians have a lot of trenches, minefields, artillery, and other defensive uh, defensive um, defensive uh, means. And going step by step uh, towards Stavros, what is the operative goal in this development? Is it the northern uh, northern shore of the Sea of Azov, or is it something else? Well, of course, uh, there were goals at the beginning of this operation, and it was quite obvious that ultimate goal is uh, cutting, physically cutting this so-called land bridge. But right here, right now, for Ukraine to say that uh, our offensive is successful, uh, I would say it would be fine, given all the conditions on the ground, given the system of defense created by the Russians, given all the limitations and constraints we have. For Ukraine, it would be fine to come to at least to Tokmak. And uh, from this ground, from these positions, maybe start another offensive, another push forward uh, at the next spring. So for Ukraine, it would be fine at least to come to, to Tokmak, uh, and uh, that's that's how I see the situation. There is, of course, this idea as if Ukraine is successful in coming to Tokmak, we can take on the so-called fire control of the, all the roads in this uh, land bridge, but, uh, well, I am a bit, a bit more cautious, because uh, uh, to take uh, fully into the fire control, you need to be with the radius of like 40 kilometers, or better even 25 to 30 kilometers. That's why for Ukraine, it would be fine to come to the outskirts of Tokma and uh, solidify control of these uh, territories and then maybe regroup without r allowing the Russians to regroup and uh, replenish the stock and prepare for the next year campaign. Mm -hmm.
Well, when we're talking about Tokmak, like for our audience, uh, if you look at the map, you will see that Tokmak is a very important logistic hub. We have like most roads which are going to Tokmak if you want to have uh, undisturbed logistic uh, supply from uh, the, the Russian controlled territories of the occupied Donetsk region to uh, like to Kherson region, uh, you need to go through Tokmak. So Tokmak has a very special location. And also like I've been two days ago in Zaporizhia where I was um, uh, like where I was in contact with the 47th uh, mechanized brigade. And uh, the soldiers explained to me that uh, they have like a pretty pretty complicated development going to Tokmak because like when you go to Tokmak you go up upwards because Tokmak is pretty high it's about like 120 150 meters higher than the positions of the Ukrainian army now so they go all the way uphill and the Russians have like uh, much better positions for uh, shooting for targeting the Ukrainian units for shooting at them and only after they reach Tokmak they can have this view over the over the valley so a pretty pretty tricky development. But when we come back like to what we expected from this offensive and what can be reached, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but the Kharkiv offensive was very fast because the Russians were not prepared and they had no time to, to, to dig the defensive lines. But here we have um, well-prepared defensive lines with a lot of minefields, a lot of artillery, a lot of anti-tank guided missile teams with these coordinates and Fagot and other missiles. Uh, and uh, is it so that it is not like that the Ukrainian army need to go like just like two kilometers, three kilometers, and then they come to operative space and can expand, but it is actually uh, many dozens of kilometers of defensive lines. Is it uh, what the Ukrainian army is facing now and how, how this situation can be solved? Well, the problem is that uh, since Russians constructed quite a sophisticated system, you already described most of development elements of this uh, quite sophisticated system. The problem is that while we are breaching uh, this so-called tactical depths of defense, Russians, they have a time to construct new lines. And that's why uh, we are constantly in this period of like uh, penetration, given the slow slowness of the process. That's why we are not able to move beyond this so-called tactical depths because Russians, they have time to create a new tactical depths at a new position, and that's uh, the major problem. But, well, given all the constraints we have, that's the only possible development because, again, there is the school of thought. If Ukraine is more forceful, if we throw more equipment, if we throw more manpower, it means that uh, even if we lose more people in penetrating this tactical depths, then we can quickly uh, do an exploitation phase, throw maneuver formations and so on. But as for me, this, uh, this, this idea it doesn't work. We've tried it at the beginning of June. We've seen it's quite risky, given all the elements in the Russian defense. That's why we are slowly dismantling the Russian system of defense from the other way around. So since uh, uh, there is this problem of minefields uh, connected with artillery, attack helicopters, and the tank guided missiles, uh, and other things. So to do the mining and move on, so we need first to decrease the effectiveness of the artillery fire of the Russians. That's why a lot of counter battery fight, uh, then to create conditions for the mining and to move on. That's why we see another tactics and uh, it's quite, uh, well, I would say substantive, well, it, very deliberate, but yes, it has a downside that it's slow one and it allows Russians to regroup around to create new positions. And we need to start it all, all the way around from the beginning to, to breach another lawyer of the tactical defenses. Uh, how helpful is, if, um, if any helpful, uh, the Western provided trainings for the Ukrainian soldiers? Uh, could the Western trainings, like if we go like uh, outside of the very technical issues of like how to operate Bradley or a Leopard, uh, how to make repair, uh, like how to operate these techniques, uh, did technical, uh, did a tactical training uh, provided by the West help the Ukrainian army to fight the Russian army? Well, uh, there was a lot of uh, debate, a lot of criticism directed uh, at Ukraine, but I appreciate the fact that there are Western analysts uh, that admit that Western training has also has a kind of deficiencies. 
and I advise everyone to read the Rusi report, recent one that outlined this kind of deficiencies, uh, outlined the fact that it's quite difficult to recreate the conditions Ukrainian face on the ground on Western training ranges. I mean, like the ability to create the density of UAVs. Uh, Ukrainians need to operate both friendly ones and enemy ones. It's also about the level of training because, uh, again, we appreciate uh, that some kind of basic skills are acquired, but the problem is doing training at a company, battalion, brigade level, and very little time is left to, to do after some basic training. And that's why there is a good suggestion that let Ukrainians do basic training in Ukraine. And when people move abroad, they start training at the company at battalion level. And there is, of course, this issue that, well, uh, most of the Western training programs, they uh, don't meet the requirements of the warfare in the battlefield current, currently operated uh, by Ukrainians. Because uh, most of these manuals, most of these training programs, they were created for counterinsurgency. And that's why, uh, again, candid analysts, true analysts, objective analysts, they admit that if, for instance, the, the same kind of assignment uh, is, uh, is given to like some kind of Western European armed forces, it would be very difficult for them to perform. And who knows what uh, level of proficiency they would demonstrate on the conditions Ukrainians operate. That's precisely the reason why we are saying don't... Uh, teach us how to fight. It doesn't mean that we don't need training. We need training. We need some basic skills. It means that, well, uh, since we have a unique conditions you never faced, and it's not only about air superiority, which is important. It's also about the level of mining, obstacles, uh, system of fire created by Russians, and so on. So don't apply mechanically your own doctrine, your own lessons. That's uh, the, the reason why when Ukraine are saying don't, don't teach us, or please be more more cautious in the advices you provide. It means this kind of thing. It doesn't mean that we don't value. We value uh, training provided by the Western countries, by European countries, by uh, US and so on. But there are a lot of caveats. There is a lot of details. And as I said, a lot of analysts, uh, true analysts, they admit that there is deficiencies in Western training program uh, also, and they need to be remedied. And uh, in general, there is uh, a kind of agreement among experts in public uh, debate, when you see who is providing this or that kind of opinion, that it's very difficult to master combined armed warfare at scale in a one point half to two months. Uh, and uh, that's uh, the reality of war. You only acquire skills for real combat. You can't, uh, with any kind, the most sophisticated pre deployment mm -hmm. training, it would never make troops as prepared as possible for the combat. Mm -hmm. So the real uh, opportunity to acquire skills, it's in combat. It means, again, losses. And that's why, uh, again, this uh, debate uh, ideas provided that Ukraine need to be more forceful, but we need to preserve as much troops as possible both to move on, but also people learn skills, because otherwise you need to learn it uh, once again. I mean, fresh people come and they need to start it uh, again. So that's why there is a lot of uh, scenes to consider from this offensive, including uh, the sophistication, the level of training, some nuances, some uh, downsides in a Western training program. That's why we value everything we receive, including training. But let's be honest that there are a room for improvement. Yeah, absolutely. I have heard stories uh, of trainings provided uh, in the West uh, when uh, the Ukrainian soldiers ask for direct advice, like what should we do? when we face a, a minefield uh, in our offensive and the advice was well like you just like get, like 500 uh, meter left or right or one mile left or right and you just uh, like go uh, this this minefield around but uh, it is absolutely impossible maybe it's possible in afghanistan or in iraq where the limited amount of mines like uh, was used by the by the insurgents like maybe some roads were mined but the next road was not mined but in Ukraine, there are like uh, dozens and hundreds of kilometers of minefields. You cannot just go left or right. Um, it is impossible. The same like with the, um, with the support of, of artillery. You cannot just go to the hill, uh, take your binocular and observe the field. First, there is no, field, uh, there is no hill in, the, uh, in uh, Kherson or the Parisian Oblast. And second, you will not survive. 
uh, the situation will just like uh, stay with your equipment on the top of the hill and uh, try to provide the, the advice. So the tactics which were okay against insurgents, as you said, they are absolutely um, useless uh, uh, when you face the Russian army with a lot of artillery, drones, uh, with uh, electronic warfare, uh, with minefields, and with, with, the, with, the other, with the other means. But if we come uh, back to the situation on the ground, we have concentrated recently uh, discussing the Zaporizhia region, but we still have Donetsk region and Luhansk region, where the Russians try to start some sort of their counteroffensive which uh, seems to have failed. What are the Russian goals in this summer campaign? Uh, well, their most important goal, their number one assignment is to repel Ukrainian offensive. That's why they are throwing all the manpower, spare manpower uh, in the Parisian region. Uh, that's their number one task. Uh, and uh, the activities you mentioned around Kupiansk, it's also directly connected with the Parisian region because the main task, uh, along with maybe replaying the results of Balaklia Kupiansk offensive operation done last year by Ukrainian forces, is first and foremost to deflect as much Ukrainian forces as possible. Fortunately, it failed without producing a major exchange of territories. According to Ukrainian data, Russians uh, needed uh, to regroup and a uh, very small amount of territory changed hands. And the uh, Russians, they are still like eight to ten kilometers from Kupiansk to the north, uh, to the northeast of the Kupiansk. Uh, if you are talking about other uh, like major operational accesses uh, in uh, Bakhmut, we have uh, quite a good successes, but uh, actually we are uh, facing the limits of what can be done. I mean, we fully reduced uh, Russian salient to the uh, southwest. Of Bakhmut, we partially reduced Russian salient to the northwest. We pinned as much Russian forces as possible. We recently uh, have reports about Andriyevka, and also there is developments going on in Klishivka with Russian activities, uh, with Ukrainian activities against Russians. But we are facing the limits because to move on, we need uh, spare uncommitted forces, and we don't have this kind of luxury. And if Ukrainian military command, highest military command, ha, uh, has, for instance, like two, three army corps. For sure, uh, the Parisia direction, Melitopol direction, so-called, is most promising one, and that is the direction where uh, these forces might have been committed. In the uh, round of Divka situation is mostly the same one, with even uh, some local Ukrainian successes around Dopetne, but... Uh, for both Ukraine and Russia, this axis is secondary in terms of how much we can spare compared with other directions. We also have uh, success south to Velikanovasilka, but after like uh, liberation of uh, Staromikhailovka, uh, Staromayorska, I'm sorry, Staromayorska, uh, that, w that happened uh, at the beginning of August. Right here, right now, we're trying to reduce Russian salient uh, around Novodonetsk and Novomayorsk, but without uh, success. Mm -hmm. And uh, in general, uh, the most important uh, part of the front line is uh, Zaporizhia region, where the fate of this campaign, this the summer part of this campaign would be decided. That's why, despite both Ukrainian and Russian attempt to deflect attention, to deflect resources, most of the resources are concentrated there by both sides. Well, we have uh, seen already the, the Russian attempts to mobilize as much possible manpower. Uh, not only the Russian citizens. We have uh, seen like how they try to recruit the Cuban mercenaries, how they forcibly conscript labor migrants from uh, Central Asian countries like uh, Tajikistan and others, like people who came to Russia um, like for jobs but have been forcibly conscripted or been lied into army, like, uh, for example, they have been sent to Mariupol, to Russian-occupied Mariupol, and it was promised to them that they will uh, work there as construction workers, but they found themselves in the Russian army after all. Can we say that uh, the Russians have like some significant amount of manpower resources which is still untapped? Like we are talking about the plant mobilization in, in, in Russia for the next month. Uh, is it something that the Russians can do? Uh, well, nominally Russians have a lot of spam and power, but uh, 
again, it's quite nominally, because the issue of another round of official mobilization, if you remember, it was discussed from the January of this year. And for, I don't know what kind of reasons we can debate them, different hypotheses, Putin didn't do this kind of scene. Well, I can uh, say there is a number of reasons that prevented him from doing this. First, uh, for the strategic defense they are currently doing, they need much less. And partial clandestine mobilization that is ongoing constantly for 18 months, it's more or less fine to replenish the losses. Because according to the main intelligence directorate, this partial clandestine mobilization is giving the Russians like 20, 25,000 troops a month. And for the strategic defense, you need less of manpower compared with the strategic offensive operation. Uh, another issue, well, uh, uh, despite the fact that Putin is autocrat and his autocracy is tending to, to totalitarian regime, despite this fact, uh, he, he still might fear the backlash from another round of mobilization. And, uh, well, we've already seen what uh, the first round of mobilization attained. All they were able to attain is just to stabilize the front line and the uh, second uh, offensive in eastern Ukraine it failed spectacularly with major losses like 100,000 troops at least died and uh, well I suppose that Putin uh, here remembers the lessons of the first world war when at some period after a lot of losses after the desperate state of the Russian armed forces imperial Russian army uh, they uh, turned their arms against official regime and uh, again, that's also the issue of control uh, of the armed forces. It's the one thing to control like half a million troops. It's another thing to control one million troops. I mean, in terms of political control to prevent some kind of mutiny. And so we already seen one mutiny. That's why, despite the fact that nominally Russia has a lot of manpower, and this is the argument that is provided by the proponents, let's be honest, by the proponents of the some kind of negotiation with Russia, mm -hmm. they are threatening Ukraine. So in this game of uh, exhaustion, you don't have any kind of chance. That's why better for you to do a kind of mobilization. But as for me, uh, this this issue with mobilization, why Putin postponed it, why it's, it's still debated, it's a very cautious story. It means that something is of major concern for Putin, why he is not calling mobilization. And that's why not better not to threaten Ukraine with uh, indefinite stock of manpower in Russia compared with Ukrainian man stock, and uh, better uh, learn uh, why Putin is not doing this kind of things. And I suppose even if he's uh, going to do this kind of thing again, it would be maybe four, three, four uh, hundred thousand to plug losses to sustain the front line and nothing else. Because uh, again, as I said, there is a lot of. Uh, nuances a lot of issues that are a major concern for putin that's why this issue is very important and uh, when you see that somebody is threatening ukraine with indefinite russian manpower i'm 100 percent sure next thing he or she is going to do is to say let let ukraine negotiate which is a total nonsense as for me oh well thank you for this uh, insight about uh, like the, the 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 russian the russian um capacities uh, which are uh, of course not uh, endless as many in the west believe like russia is actually a very small uh, country uh, with uh, not that big uh, part of population and uh, many russian males of the conscription age they're not in the best physical shape mental shape like a lot of alcohol consumption problems uh, etc. But we have a question from the audience. Uh, Sasha Ostanin asks, um, what is happening with uh, Russia's weapons and ammunition production? There are reports that Russia has been increasing its ammunition production and trying to recruit North Korea as an ammo producer. Uh, that is actually a very, a very uh, interesting story that North Korea uh, was pumped by the Soviet weapons in the 50s and 60s and uh, is not a country which is associated with high-tech military production and now russia is suddenly uh, not dependent but um, at least asking north korea to provide like some ammunition and weapons um, what is about this development well uh, all the figures we are provided it it should be put into context so i also seen these reports that russia is going both to increase the amount of uh, ammunition produced annually and also to engage North Korea, but uh, all these figures provided, I mean, that Russia is going to increase the rate of production from 1 million to 2 million, that maybe 
North Korea is going to provide something, given the fact. You mean you mean you mean two million uh, ammunition? Uh, two million uh, two million artillery shells. Two million artillery shells. Yeah. Uh, so uh, these stories need to put into context because. Uh, there was a figure, public figure, provided that last year Russia used uh, from 10 to 11 million shells, and this year uh, the estimate is that they are going to use 7 million shells. So even if Russia increases this production to 2 million shells, and even if, if, if it's able to get from North Korea, I don't know, maybe a couple of hundred thousand, because uh, North Koreans, they also have their own requirements, they need to threaten Seoul, unfortunately. Uh, also, it's about redundancy rate because uh, a lot of uh, munitions they beyond their life expectancy and uh, they malfunction and so on. That's why even if Russia is able to uh, get more munitions, uh, I'm 100% sure that it's not enough to renew some kind of large offensive. And it's open question whether it would be enough even for successful defense given the consumption rate. It's still huge by the Russian standards. It's decreased compared with 2002, uh, 2022, but it's still huge. That's why all the figures we receive, all the figures we see, uh, it should be put uh, into the context. And context is quite not favorable to Russia. But when we uh, see it, all these, like we have seen already, all these uh, reports, uh, in Russia stated that they will produce like the new tanks, uh, like 100 or 200 tanks produced from scratch by Ural Wagon Zavod or like a uh, refurbishing of all the tanks which have been delivered from the from the storage depots and after all like it all ended uh, to be like a hot air they were not technically capable to uh, produce that much tanks or artillery pieces etc maybe the same is with the um with the ammunition we have already seen their promises that they will produce like thousands of new Lancet drones or Shahid drones, but um, obviously, thank God, uh, they are not capable uh, for that. But if we um, if we return uh, back to the question of Ukraine hitting Russian uh, military objects on the territory uh, which is controlled by Russia or even Russian sovereign territory, like the air base uh, close to Pskov in the northern Russia, northwestern Russia all the Russian air bases in Kaluga region and Bransk region. Do we observe now the development that the Ukrainians just push the Russian safety zone further and further from the Ukrainian border, forcing the Russians to operate from a safe distance? Well, with regards to the the so-called in-depth strike uh, and the end goal we are trying to attain, uh, it's uh, an open question for me. I mean, uh, we lack data to assess what is the end goal, but at least first we need to start uh, from the from the recalling that uh, Ukraine start to do some indigenous solutions when uh, last year it was denied uh, attacks uh, short-range ballistic missile. And that's why we have the gap of capabilities. And uh, the idea was the following one, and it's a sound one. You can prevail in the war if its war is done in your territory. So we need to do what Russians are doing for us. So they are make as hard as possible first to leave and second to do a regrouping of forces. So if we just stick to defense, we uh, won't prevail. There is no way we can prevail. And it is uh, was clearly stated by... General Zaluzhny and General Zabrotsky, who is now deputy, uh, one of the deputies of uh, General Zaluzhny. So that's how it started. The second uh, scene important, it's the type of, of targets we strike. There are at least three types of targets. So first is uh, Mos Moscow proper and these skyscrapers. The second scene is uh, Russian air bases. And it's a unique feature because air bases are quite vulnerable because Russians, they don't invest in this maintenance in uh, this basis uh, to host this uh, equipment. That's why they're quite... And, and, the, and the Russian strategic bombers, they don't produce new ones. So you hit one strategic bomber, actually, like Russia cannot replace it. That, that's precisely it. Another kind of targets is... Uh, so-called uh, military industrial plants of different kinds that are producing subcomponents and other kind of scene. And another, of course, is directly related to the generation, sustainment and employment of the grouping of forces, uh, this inter-service grouping of forces in the Ukrainian 
temporary occupied territories. So these are the four kinds of targets. They are quite different one. We are striking all of them. And uh, as I've said previously, one of the scenes we might uh, try to attain is to create as much dilemmas as possible for Russian air defense. So what are you are going to defend with limited stock? Because you need to defend under current conditions and at least uh, at least three kinds of uh, sites. So first, it's this inter-service grouping of forces that requires uh, air defense uh, that is operated by the Russians in uh, eastern and southern Ukraine. Another is a temporary occupied Crimea, which is major logistical hub for the southern grouping of forces. And another one is a Russia proper. And that's why, uh, despite the fact that uh, Russian army has this advantage of different kinds of air defense system, they have both air defense of the land forces and the air defense component in the uh, aviation and space forces, but it's not enough to cover this amount of territory, this amount of side. It might be also Ukrainian end goal. But as I said, so there are at least four types of goals. Uh, and uh, to, be, to be honest, I'm a proponent of the idea that we need to strike uh, either sites related to the generation, sustainment and employment of forces or the ones that generate revenues for Russia or the part of military industrial complex. But again, since I don't have all the information for me, it's very difficult to judge this whole strategic framework applied in these strikes. Well, that is an amazing insight. And we have seen already in the last year that uh, the Ukrainian offensives, uh, they, they brought success, but they did not end the war out of quite obvious reason because of the um, massive resources which Russia invested in in, uh, in this war. But Ukraine is going further and further, liberating more and more territories. And now Russians, as you already mentioned, the Russian main goal is to defend what they have already conquered but uh, that means that the Russians have abandoned the idea, or at least for the uh, for the next time to go in offensive. They they are in defensive now. Um, that is uh, what nobody could imagine uh, one year ago, one half year ago. Uh, Ukrainian army is in offensive. Ukrainian army is liberating territory. Ukrainian army is striking Russian territory up to Moscow and up to Russian strategic military bases. And actually, like winning initiative and dictating the the Russians the development of, of this war. Thank you so much. Uh, Mikola Beleskov uh, is a, a research fellow at National Institute for Strategic Studies in Ukraine under the leadership of Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. He has spent with us his time today, providing us with a very uh, with his knowledge and with a very deep insight. And I hope to see you soon again. Thank you, Mikola. Thanks for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone who watched it. Don't forget to subscribe, to like, to share. This live interview will be saved. You can rewatch it. You can share it with your friends and ask them to rewatch it. Don't forget to like this channel, to subscribe to this channel. And don't forget to help Ukraine find, like, your initiative, your charity initiative, most uh, most the best way from Ukraine, like life uh, come come uh, come back and alive initiative for which Mikola is also working, and uh, stay with Ukraine. Thank you so much. Have a great day.